Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. This video is going to be my look at This Month in Dragalia Lost by director Okada for the month of January 2020. Pretty excited to flip through this and provide some of my speculation and predictions for what we'll be seeing this month. We found out about an event rerun as well as the Monster Hunter collab, we got our first details on that. In addition to some extra information about the event that's happening right now, a Clawful Caper. So I'm going to look through this today as usual, but we'll be taking some breaks, having some diversions to make this a little bit more interesting. I have not checked out the Omega Raid in a Clawful Caper yet, or at least the Omega Solo, which is available now. So I do want to do that for the first time as well and share that with y'all. But here we go with this month in Tregalia Loss. So of course, director Okada wishes us a happy new year and hopes that we'll continue to play Dragalia Loss this year. I hope so too. Uh, since this is the first month in Dragalia Loss for the new year, we have information about events that'll occur this month, but also the Monster Hunter collab that they announced last year. So the first section is all about a Clawful Caper, it gives some details on what to do in this event. I know there is still some confusion about this from my experience playing this event in pubs, but there's going to be fish that spawn when you're playing the raid event. If you're playing on Nightmare or Omega difficulty, then Ebisu, the boss, can spawn fish multiple times. Typically when you break his tail around then, I believe, he will be able to spawn additional fish. You're going to want to destroy all those fish to give yourself the best chance of good and even legendary drops at the end of the raid battle. So it mentions you should defeat the fish that appear in battle. The rewards can get even better. It also talks about Hanabusa and his interesting and unique faces. Hanabusa has turned out to be a very strong welfare unit. I think the only thing really holding him is back is he only has 50% curse res but he has really surprisingly high uh, damage modifiers on his first skill for a welfare unit, and his second skill provides team buff, so I could easily see him going the route of Botan. And Hanabusa has already cleared Expert Volk as well, so even though the new Agito content favors Flame Adventurers, he happens to have that Therion's Bane, he's mostly providing buffs to the team, he can carry Popstar Siren while taking advantage of her Dragon Aura, so he's surprisingly good and a really nice welfare unit to get. Blade units are always pretty solid. So we hear more about him and these cute weapons that you can get from the event. Now from what I can tell these are random drops and they're not so frequent that it's super easy to max unbind these. But the great thing is with the weapon skin feature now, even if you get one copy of each of these by playing the event, you'll be able to use those as skins and it's not like these are super powerful, game-changing weapons on their own. They're really just here for the cosmetic, and it is hilarious to slap people around with this fish or with the mouse, so I kind of like these. I think they're a cute way to have cosmetic rewards in the game. Kind of sad that the Lucky Hanatsuki Paddle from last year did not make a return in the shop, since weirdly enough, even though that was not a great value, I kind of would consider purchasing it this year. I just think that having the weapon skin options actually makes having a variety of weapons more fun, so I would actually consider getting that even though it's a really bad weapon. But then we get some details about the summon showcase, so we hear about Mitsuhide, the logic behind her, so the fact that she is emblematic of the dagger weapon type, her strength increases with her combo count, and she also has Paralyzed Punisher, making her work well with other light adventurers. Nobunaga, and they clarify here, in case you're confused about this, the way that Nobunaga works, you might be wondering, why does she dispel so many buffs? You know, is that even relevant in a lot of content? And the answer is, in a lot of content, enemies don't buff themselves. Pretty much in Expert Volk's Wrath and Master High Midgard Sormer is where you'd really want to use her to dispel buffs, but... The thing is, her burning ambition effect that she applies to enemies, it counts as a buff. So that's essentially her whole playstyle and her whole loop, and hopefully what you got to see with my summoning video recently where I decided to go ahead and slip in some footage where I had a lot of fun building up combo with her against Expert Volk. So Nobunaga's pretty fun adventure, not really pushing the power limits at this point. 
Mitsuhide, I think, is probably the stronger of the two. And we also find out, I mean, they even explicitly mention High Midgard's former trial master and Volk's wrath. But then we also find out a little bit about Chitose, Daiko Kuten. Chitose has been pretty awesome in High Zodiac's trial. The one thing you want to be mindful of, though, is in a lot of teams, there's a couple Gala Yudin. They're going to be very far from the boss as Cupid using ranged attacks. Chitose is probably going to be the second closest adventurer, and typically the, uh, the move that Hyzodiark does, where he spits out poison, it's going to target the two closest. Typically, that's going to include Chitose, so you do need to be prepared to bait that and not get hit by that. So do keep that in mind if you plan to main her or bring her into that trial, but she has been extremely effective, especially running a buff-oriented dragon like Popstar Siren. Daiko Kuten is also quite good. Uh, probably around the same level as Core Saint Phoenix, maybe a little bit better on some adventurers, a little bit worse on others. You do need to be able to keep that combo count up to maximize her, but for weapon types like wands, bows especially, daggers, they either can easily keep up combo count or they can ramp up quickly enough that when you combine her basic 55% strength, which is already pretty good, with that nice attack rate buff that she gets on her skill, and then you get additional strength, up to 80 total, I think, from her Whirlwind Strength effect, uh, or his Whirlwind Strength effect, excuse me. Daikokuten's a really good dragon. Then we hear about the login bonus. That includes a lot of Blessed Ashes, which comes at a good time because the raid's pretty fun to play. And also we have these Expert Void battles. We want to be farming up Tier 4 orbs for Mana Spirals. Some cases we want to be playing Volk's Wrath or High Dragon Trials to try to get weapons to do Volk's Wrath or for future Agito bosses. So these login bonuses are pretty welcome. They come at a good time. And that's pretty much all that's mentioned here about that event. So I think now we'll take a break. Let's go ahead and play the Omega, see how it is. I've heard it's not too hard. So let's go ahead and head into a Clawful Caper here. I was having a lot of fun playing Nightmare, so I went ahead and played it up just until the point that I was able to unlock Omega. So you do need 3,000 golds, uh, 600 silvers, and 600 bronze. And at that point, you'll have all three of the Omega keys. Right now, only Solo is available. And later on, there will be a raid, I think in a couple days, and then it'll come back later. Um, one of the things that is being talked about a lot right now with this is the fact that you can get whole Damascus ingots by playing this if you're defeating those uh, fish that spawn. So you really want to try to give yourself a good chance to get rare drops. There's also the chance of summon vouchers, golden fragments, which are just okay, twinkling grains, which are just okay. But when you're early on, any of those resources are pretty precious. And you can even randomly get some of these five-star core weapons that... Uh, you know, at one point, were some of the strongest, most definitive weapons, and even now, if you're relatively new to the game or just haven't had a lot of Twinkling Sand to build out an arsenal, it's still going to be a nice power upgrade for your team, potentially. So I think that's a really smart inclusion of those. Uh, and the real prize, though, is for the first clear. We're going to get half an ingot, five crystals, for doing that. So as elusive as this may be, I'm pretty pumped about this because right now I'm sitting on three Damascus ingots. And if this is also the first clear reward for the co-op version, that will put me at four. That will let me max unbind uh, a tier two weapon, which would be pretty sweet. So here's the team I'm working with. I really wanted to try out Mitsuhide after summoning her. So probably going to be a little sloppy here, but I think it's going to be fun to play as her nonetheless. And I've seen some people clearing this in like one minute or less. So I'm not too worried about our DPS. I'm more worried about tracking down and catching all those fish. So typically I like to stand back. Um, the reason being that sometimes the AI can accidentally target the boss. And with those red lines that spawn, they'll either be horizontal or vertical. And they can inflict bogs. So you do want to be careful about that. Then that Fury Fandango causes the fish to dance, but if the fish are already destroyed like they are now, nothing will happen at all when the boss does that. Paw Storm is kind of interesting. It can actually energize you when you get hit by it. The other pattern that the fish sometimes do when they spawn is that they have like a circle that spawns around them. 
kind of cool. Uh oh, that was not good. I was gonna say kind of cool that the fish actually uh, can hurt you because it kind of incentivizes players to realize that they actually should try to defeat the fish in case people didn't read notices. All right, we destroyed the tail here, so I think I'm gonna keep attacking just because it seems like there's plenty of HP. Let me back off to see if I can save my AI. Oh, we did an okay job. They're not dead. And there we go. We're Now we're getting the second fishing wave. Okay, and we want to try to defeat all these fish. I like using a dragon here to chase them down. There's the circle pattern that I mentioned. And Takumi Kazuchi is just fun for this because of how he can kind of dash forward. Uh, and you can change direction. It feels very much like Volt Tackle or Supersonic, like the Smash Roll. Um, so it's fun to use. But I think we've defeated all the fish. Sometimes I like to do one last check around the battlefield. While he's broken, let's hope that he doesn't die. But if you kind of like walk around, you can make it so that your AI don't aggro the boss. Let me just Phoenix for good measure, since I went ahead and brought along Yudin anyway for player EXP. And, uh-oh. All right, we weren't able to get off our skill in time, but I think we're easily getting this with the Deathless. And will that finish off the boss? There we go. All right, so not too bad. Looks like we're just going to get a basic reward. When it's white like that and doesn't change to gold, it's usually just like a basic reward. If it starts off white and changes to gold, sometimes it will change to rainbow afterward. I've so far gotten a couple golden fragments, but that's about it. So nothing too crazy off of that. But it is cool that you can actually repeatedly farm the Omega Solo now, and it can kind of be worth it if you want to try to get rare rewards. Personally, I still need a lot of materials for mana spirals, so I'm not going to be uh, doing a lot of, you know, farming for rare drops. But now we can actually take a uh, preview or see a peek at the raid version. So it looks like that will start in a couple days. Let's see what the rewards are like from that. Nice. So we are going to get our other five Damascus crystals. So that's the main thing I was hoping for. Let's accept our Wormite and head back to this month in Dragalia Lost. So hopefully you didn't have too much trouble with the raid. One last thing I should say about the raid is it is a little better to do Nightmare difficulty compared to Expert. First of all, the boss will spawn two waves of fish. And then second, the drops include that Damascus ingot. And I think the drop rates are better uh, from what the devs mentioned to us in the event announcement. So I guess that's it for the event. Let's keep going. Flames of Reflection and Monster Hunter. So let's start with Monster Hunter. I'd like to take some time to talk about the Monster Hunter event, which we announced at the end of last year. The event will have a story and a summon showcase, which is pretty sweet because arguably Mega Man didn't have either of those, although it did have a little story. And I'm going to share a little info about one of the adventurers who will appear in that showcase. It's Berserker, and he's all decked out in Rothalos armor. This version of Berserker is a sword user, but in Monster Hunter terms, he was designed as a great sword user. When you charge up his Force Strike, you will use the powerful charge attack that is characteristic of great swords. You'll also be able to get Monster Hunter inspired weapons during this event. Some follow designs from the Source games, but some are also brand new designs with the Monster Hunter feel. Absolutely awesome, great fan service. Berserker, perfect character, Rothless armor, awesome. I think that they're doing justice to this collaboration. And weapons has been a fun direction, I feel, between the Mega Man cosmetic weapons and now the New Year's one. Uh, I think it's I think it's fine. And I, I think I'm happy that we have a way to use these without diminishing the weapons that we've grinded out that are inherently more powerful. So I would prefer that these drops from Monster Hunter are more just aesthetic in nature rather than like actually power creeping some of our existing weapons. But if you're an intermediate player, mid-range player, uh, working on your endgame content, not quite there yet, I think these fit in at a nice place where for some of those players, these could probably be better weapons than anything they already have. That's kind of what I hope at least how it works out. But I think that's the case for Mega Man and the New Year's event. So let's see. In this event, there will also be a boss battle where you can place barrel bomb L items. 
but that's not all the Monster Hunter mechanics we're planning on including in the boss battles. We're also planning some boss enemies without elemental attunement, yes! So we plan to make this event one that you can challenge using adventures of various elements. That is going to be cool. I did like that about Mega Man's Trial. You know, you could have a really crazy team of units. Halloween Loen was a staple, of course, Gala Cleo reared her head. But, you know, you could have some pretty fun adventures in there. I know I used my Summer Julieta, I used my Reina a lot in that event. And they did just fine because of the neutral element content. And so you have to wonder, you know, what type of team synergies could you come up with or mix and match units with when you're going across elements? And one of the things I think of is like, say, uh, Summer Celiera. You know, she can buff the entire team's defense, maybe trigger some double buff action on other adventurers. She also can bog, perhaps combine her with Reyna so you could burn the enemy, have Burning Punisher and bog, have that nice double buff synergy. I mean, there's all sorts of cool interactions, like maybe I could use my Eleonora as a poison enabler and use Ieyasu, who got a recent mana spiral, and he does extra damage against poison enemies. I think opening up elemental content and having neutral element is really cool. I really think that that just scratches that itch for team building and uh, strategy that I've always enjoyed in Dragalia Law, so I'm hopeful that that's a fun a boss fight or series of boss fights where we can actually strategize around that. And then it says the Monster Hunter event will start in late January, so be sure to keep an eye on Twitter and your notifications for updates. They will republish the pictures of Berserker and of the weapons that you can acquire during the event at a later date. So we still didn't get any actual imagery of the event other than the Rothalos that we got during the digest that looks sweet. But I have some speculation as to the adventures I think might be featured on the banner. So I'm going to head over to my teams. You already saw my raid team, but let me show you who I think might be on the Monster Hunter banner. This is pure speculation, just some theory crafting, some units I kind of want to see. But as you can see, Berserker is there, of course. I've also included Hawk. Hawk is the Twilight Hunter. One of his skills is called Hunter's Creed. In his description, it's mentioned that he is a knowledgeable and skilled hunter. And if you just look at him, I mean, this is just one of the coolest units in Dragalia Loss. And look how he's geared out. I feel like his outfit's so cool. Haircut, super good. I forgot I had the Japanese voice on, but when you have it on English, he frequently refers to the hunt. So I think that he needs to be here. And he has not gotten an alt yet. He's He, along with Makoto, are the only two original five-star adventurers that have not gotten alts. I could really see him getting an alt here. Uh, Berserker just loves to battle, and we already know that he's going to be there, but I think for that reason he is a great fit for this. Uh, he just loves fighting, and he enjoys on uh, he enjoys combat. He's a frenzied warrior. I think he's a perfect fit for this. Malka is one I think could be a sleeper pick. If you look at Malka's artwork on Armorer's Aspirations, that's a four-star worm print. He really looks like a very interesting character. You get some backstory on that where he is, he really prizes his work on armor, but I feel like his artwork here doesn't do him justice. And I don't know if it's like the bags under his eyes from working so hard or his pose or his hair, whatever it is, but I feel like he could use the Zardin glow up. And I kind of think that he might get an alt on this. So he's all about the armor, and if nothing else, I could see him being in the event story where he's crafting your armor as part of the event, maybe working alongside um, some of the Sisters of the Anvil. There you go, that's what they're called. Zace is the other lance I think has a shot. Zace just kind of looks like uh, a hunter, uh, and he is from a society of hunters, but his whole thing is bones and archeology. span so I kind of feel like that's a little bit too specific. So he might not get an alt. He was also released after the launch of the game, which could hurt him. But if you look at him, he already looks pretty decked out for the hunt. He looks pretty cool as is. So maybe, I don't know that there could be this many units featured. And of course, there's one other thing that is definitely missing here. And that is, there's almost always female units given a rate up these days. 
uh, for better or for worse, they're often at five star. And I know there's been some controversy and discussion about that. So I do want to give some honorable mentions as to who else I think could show up. I think that there's a chance that we get Vanessa to show up because she does enjoy combat a lot. Um, she is a fighter, but she's kind of more of a knight, and I feel like she's more of a brawler, like not necessarily fighting fiends and slaying fiends and monsters all the time. Uh, she's fighting other people, I feel. So I don't know that we would get Vanessa, but I do think it's a possibility, so I want to shout her out. I also think, let's see if we can find them here. I think Yue might show up as well. So let's look at Yue. Yue is a hungry hunter, that's her epithet, so she's a hunter for sure. But also the fact that she's just hungry all the time I see as resonant with Monster Hunter, especially Monster Hunter World. I've seen the cutscenes of food in that game and I feel like Yue would be a perfect fit in one of those cutscenes and it would be very adorable. So I think Yue has a chance. And then moving on... I mean, some of these characters might fit in surprising ways, but I think Ron, if not Hawk, Ron is the Wild Hunter. His abilities are Fiend Crush and Critter Slayer. He is really, really about hunting, and he is even worse than Hawk, I feel like he really needs a good alt. So I could also see Ron showing up as well. Maybe even somebody like Lara Noah or Silas, because I kind of feel like Sylvans might have a prominent role in this just because of their connection to nature. But otherwise, that's pretty much it. You know, there could be a chance that we get like a Johanna because of her love of fighting, but I don't know that I associate her with fiend slaying as much. So I think those are probably the candidates I think are most likely. Let's put Hawk back on, give him his bow, and head back to the rest of this month in Dragalia Lost. We're almost toward the end here, there's not that much additional information, but as we saw earlier, there is the Flames of Reflection rerun happening. So that's going to start in mid-January, pretty much guaranteed to happen after the current raid event ends. That seems very likely since that ends around the 13th, that's mid-January basically. And we're going to be able to construct the same flame facility, the Arcto statue, but they're raising the level cap, so it should go up to level 35 now, most likely. Which is good, because right now the hardest endgame content is stuff like Expert Volk's Wrath, or even Master High Midgard Swarmer to a lesser degree, and you do want very powerful flame adventures for that content. They're also adding some story to Chapter 11 of the main campaign in mid-January. This is their first time trying this, it was announced last year that this would happen, uh, but they plan to include things that are critical to the future of the story in here. Be sure to check it out. And of course, chapter 12 is coming in February. So as for Flames of Reflection, I think it's very natural that a banner will probably come out alongside this. Most likely a banner featuring Flame Adventurers. The thing about this banner originally was it had two brand new 5-star units. And nowadays, typically when a rerun happens, we see one new unit and then one of, or the old unit, who was a five star originally gets a raid up. Like when we had the rerun of Accursed Archives, only Curran got a raid up, Heinwall did not get a raid up at all. Uh, and we had our new units being Lathna and then eventually Akasha on Stirring Shadows Part Two. So I do think that we'll get a banner with this. I think it will be focused on the flame element. And my prediction is this might also tie into Mana Spirals. So let me switch over to my next team here. These are the three Sisters of the Anvil that were featured on the banner last time, as well as somebody who I think could use a Mana Spiral. So Mikoto is one of my favorites. Everybody probably knows that at this point. I want him to get a Mana Spiral. He didn't get a Mana Spiral. Probably didn't need it as much as Naveed and Azalith, who really were just not seeing any use at this point. Mikoto is still very, very good, especially with Arctos. He can do some real damage, cancel some stuff in Expert Volk. I think he's still pretty underrated and very powerful, but I think that he is still a candidate to be featured on this banner, uh, potentially as an old unit who comes back with a spiral as a way to incentivize people to summon. I think it's a small chance because most likely there will be a new unit 
and then one of Ramona or Reyna will be the old unit who comes back. I think it's more likely that Ramona comes back as an old unit and there's some brand new flame character that we've never seen before. Reyna, I think she's a little bit less likely because she did have a raid up uh, fairly recently, I want to say. I think she might have had a raid up on Leia's banner or at least a banner last year. I'm pretty sure Reyna had a raid up, shared a raid up with somebody. I'm trying to think back to when, but I do think she's been featured more than Ramona, so I think Ramona is more likely to show up here. However, I don't think Ramona would get 70 notes. I really think that she's too good already. I do think, though, that Renee will probably get a Mana Spiral and be featured. She was the one of the three Sisters of the Anvil who just was not, really not as good as the others. She inflicts Bog, which, you know, that's good, but the problem is enemies mostly have high resistances to Bog. They can only be Bogged like once a match. And if you're wasting your Bog at an inopportune time and wasting that damage increase it provides, it's actually a detriment to you, so that is not great. This move increases her defense for a short amount of time, which is okay. I mean, she has two attacking skills, and it works with her ability unlocked as a 5-star healing double buff. Whenever her defense is increased, she's going to provide healing, small amount of healing to the entire team. But I just think they could increase her modifiers, improve her substantially with a mana spiral. Maybe they could give her something... Uh, either increase this amount of healing or make this into strength and healing team double buff. That would be pretty good. They could increase the amount on prime devastation. Of course, give her potent stun res. Uh, and maybe give her something other than just bog on this first skill. Or even just increase the amount of damage it does. That would probably help her out a lot. Daggers have the tools at this point. They have Twinfold Bonds, a fantastic worm print. But... Some of them are still held back just by the fact that their skills just do very little damage, and I feel like Renee is in that category, so I do think she could use a Mana Spiral, and that might be a surprise spiral from that banner, along with potentially either Reyna or Ramona, or if my wishes are fulfilled, maybe Mikoto will be at a rate up and also get a spiral on that banner. I know that's kind of wishful thinking, but I do hope that could happen. So let's go back once again to this month in Dragalia Lost. The final thing that we were notified about was Mana Spirals in general and who is planned for January. So let's skip past Flames of Reflection. Regarding unlocking the Mana Spiral. In December, Flame Attuned Adventurers were the focus for unlocking the Mana Spiral, but in January we plan to unlock the Mana Spiral for some Shadow Attuned Adventurers as well. We'll share more information via notifications in the future. So no clue when this is going to happen. I hope it happens sooner rather than later. I'm stockpiling materials. I'm so ready to see which Shadow Adventures get powered up. It's actually one of the things that gets me excited about Dragalia nowadays, and I'm so glad that this update happened because of the relevance it adds to weaker characters. There's some additional information here about the next update happening in late January. Um, additional features making it easier to play, but nothing that is too astonishing, I think. Um, we also found out some sad news that Five Star Adventure stories are no longer going to be voiced in Japanese, which actually happened last month, which is unfortunate for those who enjoy that. And I have to say, I don't always listen to the stories in Japanese to begin with, so I didn't necessarily miss that or, or realize that that change had happened until Dragon Yule Malora. But it's an unfortunate change. I suppose due to budget or perhaps union issues. And then we got some additional Wormite. We got some details about the rest of 2020. One of the things that makes me hopeful here is that they say that they want to try to do one new event per month. So it says that they want to put a lot of efforts into events. Last year they added Agito and Advanced Dragon Trial higher difficulties. Now they want to try to do one new event per month. If they're doing that along with one uh, new story update every other month and kind of a small update in between, that is fantastic to me. That is a good pace. We're going to have a constant flow of new content. And it's probably a little slower than when the game first launched, but I think that would be great uh, and fine considering 
some of the things have been fleshed out a lot more, like the Void Battles, like the Agito Uprising. So I'm hopeful about the future schedule, some of the other features that are coming for the one and a half year anniversary. But what I mainly want to talk about with our last few minutes here is who is going to get this Mana Spiral in January? Because I think that's just a fascinating conversation and what type of updates they would need, those characters would need, to actually be relevant. So I'm going to go back over to your teams for the final time in this video and show off. You see I have four Shadow teams here, some of the adventurers who I think are likely to get the Spiral. Now in December, we got six three stars, three four stars, and three five stars. And then we also got Ieyasu randomly because he was on a raid up on a banner, I feel. Uh, so I think that we may get an old unit, just a one-off like that to sell the banner. But I think for the most part, we're probably going to see something similar of six three-star units, uh, three four stars, and three five stars. So let's start off with the three stars as to who I think will likely show up. I think they're probably going to prioritize the original three stars, not some of the three stars that have been added since the game launched. Because if you look at Flame and you look at who got snubbed, unfortunately, it was basically Marty and Valentine's Orion, both characters who were not in the game at its launch. They were added later on. So I kind of feel like any characters who are added later on more likely to get snubbed on this. But here are some of the three stars that were in the game from the beginning. Althemia, Edward, Taro, and Vice. And all of these units could really use the boost. I'll start with Althemia as we live in this Galicleo dominated world. And to some extent, Cassandra can break in now that she has her mana spiral unlocked. But Althemia is actually a very powerful three star character because she has a really solid skill damage ability. This is one of the things that made Xania so good and why she's still pretty popular in expert Volk uh, public lobbies because even as a three star, she has that skill damage co-ability and she has a nice skill damage ability. Well, Athemia also has a skill damage ability, albeit restricted to full HP, but one of her biggest problems is just not having 100% resistance and having to waste worm print slots on that. With the Mana Spiral, she would have 50% paralysis uh, potent Paralysis Res and 50% Paralysis Res, giving her 100% total. The numbers on this would probably get bumped up. And in terms of effects that I think they might put on the skills of these adventurers, I kind of think that they'll just increase the amount of damage, but they have been going a little crazy with Poison and Shadow lately. It makes me kind of sad. I don't love to see that because I feel like Wind is losing more of its identity and Eleonora being like a poison enabler is basically just gone at this point. There's so many better poison enablers. But I do think they might just tack on poison to these effects and go that route where, similar to the current uh, Agito boss Volk, how you can burn him a lot, they might have a light element boss who can poison a lot. I hope they don't go that route. I hope they're a little bit more creative, maybe find something a little more interesting to do since we've already seen poison on a lot of adventurers. But if I were to guess the simplest way for them to power up all of these Shadow Element characters, I do think it would probably just be slapping poison onto all of them. Edward is a healer, so he'll probably get the Orion treatment where this heals for a larger amount, this shields for a larger amount, maybe they even throw a defense buff onto it if they're feeling generous, and his other abilities just have higher percentages. Taro, I think Taro... He doesn't seem like a poison character to me, so maybe in a crazy world they put bleed on him or something like that, or some type of buffs, but he really doesn't seem like he's going to poison anybody, uh, so I don't know. But Taro just having the strength co-ability could end up being kind of powerful. If he does get poison, he could kind of be like the Aoi of this update where he's strong, uh, he ends up being a unique blade uh, in some ways, even more so compared to Aoi. Who is kind of like a lesser Reyna, but unfortunately his last defense is just not going to be great. Elaine has that ability as well, and it did not really serve him that well in the Spiral update. Vice. Vice right now is kind of unique. I believe this Lethal Edge can actually put enemies to sleep once it's upgraded, so Vice might be more interesting than the rest of these units. Maybe this would cause poison and this would cause sleep kind of fits with him being an assassin, being able to afflict in multiple different ways, multiple angles of attack. 
He does have Broken Punisher that's likely to get bumped up to a larger degree. And then Blindness Res, which right now is not super relevant, but, but could be, depending on the next Agito trial. So as far as the rest of the three stars, I think Eric and Rodrigo are the two who are likely to get it. Uh, the Spiral and I think Zace and Vita, because they'll release later, probably won't. Eric is kind of interesting. He can draw enemies toward him. Wild Strike deals damage. Just a good damage dealer, very solid damage dealer with the Force Strike effect. So the Force Strike effect can be interesting, but Axes are not typically known to spam Force Strikes. It's not hard to incorporate into their combo string, though. You can do five hits and then charge a Force Strike while you're jumping. So I don't know. Again, he doesn't seem like somebody that would poison to me, really. So I don't know what other type of effect they might want to put onto him other than just making him deal more damage. Maybe like defense down. That's kind of like what Corinne does, though. So I don't know if that's too, uh, too much of a copy. Rodrigo was a very popular Shadow Sword unit early on because, again, short animations, good animations on his skills, uh, quick to charge, both of them deal damage, good HP 70% strength passive effect. So Rodrigo, probably just going to be very good if he gets an update. I mean, a very just solid, but very simple unit. Zeiss and Vita, kits are more complex. I don't think they're likely to get the spiral here. For four stars, I think that we'll probably see Cleo, Norwin, and Orion. Honestly, when you look at the four stars in Shadow, uh, there are a lot of potential candidates who could use a power increase. I mean, Patia could use a power increase. I think you could argue that um, even Alex at this point, she could possibly use a power increase, but she recently got poison added to her kit. And I think she's still good enough as is that they would probably bump up Cleo first. But a lot of these original Shadow characters like Berserker or Clyman, uh, Durant maybe, but Durant is new enough and powerful enough that I think he probably wouldn't get it. But Berserker and Clyman for sure could just as easily be included on here. Uh, part of the reason I included these was because of who I think is coming at 5 star. But for Cleo, I think unfortunately as much as we're inundated by Gala Cleo, we are probably going to be seeing a lot of healer Cleo in the future. I think they will probably give her something similar to Jiang Zia's kit where this will also grant regen, as well as granting defense, and they'll just power up the numbers on these. This will be 100% skill prep and charge, potent paralysis res, and a larger amount of defense. Maybe in a crazy world, this becomes HP 70% equals defense and strength. That would be kind of crazy. Uh, but I think that Cleo is going to be just like a simple healer and maintain largely her same role. Norwin. Norman's a more recent unit, a lot of good properties on paper, three damage dealing skills, uh, one of them inflicts blind, the other one deals more damage to blinded foes, and he can power up the team whenever he blinds an enemy. He also has blindness res and blinded punisher of 20%. Norman's big issue is just that he has a low chance to actually trigger blind on this skill. So oftentimes he's going to miss with blind, not buff the team, not deal extra damage on a second skill, and his damage modifiers on his skills are just not very high. And uh, blindness was not one of the biggest winners from the affliction update that helped out poison and burn so much, and also to some extent paralysis. Blindness still accumulates in 10% chunks uh, in terms of resistance. So every time you blind an enemy, they gain 10% additional resistance to being blinded, meaning that you can't easily continuously blind them. At most, even if they had 0% blindness res, you could only blind them 10 times in a quest. And a lot of enemies start off higher than that at like 80%. So unfortunately, blindness is in that weird spot where it's just not very effective right now. So I think Norwin, even if he gets a power upgrade, he's going to need some way to... Uh, deal with that reality of how blindness is treated as an affliction because his entire kit revolves around that but I do think he could use the power upgrade. Orion. Orion's similar where everything seems good you know he can inflict blindness I believe uh, I'm not sure I thought I was going to say this might be able to debuff but I guess not but he has flurry devastation which increases his critical rate when he has a high combo count Skill prep, that's probably going to change into 100% as well as skill charge. A lot of good things, a lot of good attributes, multiple attacking skills, but just very low damage modifiers is his biggest problem. 
And Sazanka I have here as kind of a wild card because if they announce this Mana Spiral before the end of the current banner, which features Addis and Sazanka, then I think there's a chance that both of them get the Mana Spiral treatment similar to Ieyasu. I think it's a small chance, but it's a possibility. And so for that reason, I wanted to include Sazanka. And last time they had one off element character at four star. It was Botan. She did have an event happening at that time. So that might've been the reason she was on there. I kind of doubt they would do the same for Hanabusa right away, but they could. But I think it's more likely that the off element this time would be some combination of Sazanka and Addis as the off element. So potentially I think we could see Cleo, Sazanka and Addis or if they decide not to include Sasanka and Addis, then maybe something like Cleo, Orion, uh, and maybe somebody off element, maybe Norwin. So finally, to wrap things up at five star, the characters who I really think need this mana spiral the most are Nefaria, Yaten, and Galaranzal. So you're probably wondering what Galaranzal is doing here. Well, last time they had an off element character and I think they would probably do the same. I had considered that they might want a Mana Spiral Hawk, but I feel like they might want to do him later because he's so similar to Nefaria that it might feel more special to do him at another time. The reason I think Galaranzal might show up here is because we do have a Gala coming at the end of January. And I think what they might do, especially for Galaranzal, because right now he is pretty far and away the weakest Gaul adventurer. As strong as he is, he just got kind of crept by Wedding Elisan, uh, and she's a lot easier to use as well. But I think they might start doing older Gaul units also getting a raid up alongside the brand new Gaul unit. So my prediction for January is that Gaul Luca will come out, he'll be a brand new unit, but Gaul Aronzel will also have a raid up, and he will have that 70 mana nodes unlocked at that time. And that would be a cool way to give people an opportunity to get him if they're new to the game or just didn't have the resources, didn't have the luck to get him last time. It's super hard to snipe Gala characters off focus, even at the anniversary when they had like a 0.2% base appearance rate. I spent like 50,000 uh, Worm Knight, probably more than that in Diamantium, and did not get Gala Cerise. So I think this is probably a necessary way to introduce Gala characters back into the game a little bit more. And this would be a cool way of doing it where they're back, but with a power upgrade. And Galaranzal really needs that. As for Shadow, Nefaria, just like Norwin, she just has a problem that her kit is not always gonna be relevant because of blindness resistance. Her first skill does extra damage to blinded foes. Her second skill turns her four strikes into special attacks that can inflict blindness. That's her weapon skill, so we'll skip over that. And then her abilities are Paralysis Res of 100%, Blinded Punisher of 30%, and Full HP equals Blindness of 60%. I guess quintessentially her problem is all her eggs are in this Blindness basket, and it just doesn't always work on all enemies. So what I would propose as a way to make her much more effective, first of all, would be Knight of Antiquity should reduce the enemy's Affliction Resistance to Blindness. That's an effect we have not seen on Adventurers ever before, but we've seen it recently with Expert and Standard Volk's Wrath. Volk's Plague ability resets Affliction Resistance so that while Plague is active, you can cause any kind of crazy afflictions you want against Volk, and he can do the same against you. The fact that that's possible mechanically within the game gives me hope that Nefaria's first skill would have some added effect of and reduces enemy resistance to blind by 10%. If she had something like that, she could actually continuously blind enemies, and I think that would be a huge game changer for her. Now, realistically, what are they probably gonna do? They're probably just gonna like slap poison on her, slap bleeding on her like they've been doing to a lot of shadow adventurers. But if she had that, that would be so sweet, just like continuously blinding the enemy. As for Twilight Oblivion, what I want to see, but I think it's kind of unrealistic, but I think would be cool, is if when she does her special force strike, it has some type of unique animation, maybe like a homing property. One of the things that I envisioned was like, maybe when you charge the force strike, it puts the reticle on every enemy on the screen, not just on one enemy. And then you just rain down arrows all over the screen. That would be pretty awesome to behold, I feel. So I hope they do something. At the very least, Make the Force Strike deal better damage. Have it be, you know, good at diminishing the overdrive gauge or something like that. 
And if they don't want to reset affliction via this skill, maybe they can have some other kind of mechanic that resets affliction when you break the enemy or resets their affliction resistance uh, when they enter overdrive, for instance, because that usually heals them of affliction res uh, or of afflictions, but their resistance has still built up. As far as full HP equals blindness, I do expect this will be turned into some kind of unique skill or unique ability rather, just like how Ezalith got Flash of Genius from her uh, original ability of Flurry Debilitator. So I could see this being something like uh, Dark Eternity or, you know, some kind of cool name and having this type of effect, but maybe also having a debuff effect of some type or some type of affliction resetting. The other thing I thought would be awesome is if they made her blindness make it so enemies miss 100% of the time. And I think that would be somewhat balanced if they don't go too crazy with resetting affliction resistance because blindness, you can't do it that often to begin with. So it would be nice if it actually guaranteed the enemy would miss because right now it's only 50-50 that they'll miss or not. I think her paralysis res is just going to become potent paralysis res. And blinded punisher, maybe they could make this like a two-in-one ability of like blinded and broken punisher or blinded and overdrive punisher to give it a little bit more use even when the enemy's not blinded. Those are some of the ways I think they could power up Nefaria. And finally for Yaten, he is a more recent unit but one that has just kind of been overshadowed. Very fun and dynamic kits, relies on the energy mechanic which is another of these mechanics that it's just not worked out as one would have hoped. So his Festival Rush deals Shatter Damage ahead and increases that energy level by one stage. But when his energy level is five, he's energized and this will become a skill called Festival Dance that does extra damage. His Bold Blade just increases the entire team's energy level by two stages. One of the easiest changes I think they can make to Yaten to make him better is to actually make this a damage dealing skill and not just a buff to energy, not just a pure energy skill. It sounds like it should deal damage, it's called Bold Blade, but it actually just increases the entire team's energy level, so I think that would be a very simple way to power him up. As far as his other abilities, he has energy equals strength and critical rate 3. This is a really nice effect. You're getting a lot of strength and critical rate when you're fully energized. 20% strength and 8% critical rate is no joke. They could increase the modifiers on this, or maybe they could, um, well, I don't know. I really don't know what they could do with this. It's already a pretty solid effect, but maybe they could give him some other way of accumulating energy passively over time, or they could give Yaten like the skill self-charging effect, since he wants to be firing off a lot of skills, hopefully energizing them. He has energized equals, uh, energized strength of 20%, so whenever he becomes energized, he gets a strength boost. Maybe this could not just be strength, but something else. Or imagine if this was energized team strength of 20%. That would be really, really sick. So especially with him being a festival planner, having him so focused on himself other than his bold blade, I think it would be cool to widen that out. And in contrast to somebody like Natalie, who is very uh, self DPS oriented, have him be kind of a team buffer, but actually just like spam energy spam buffs onto everyone in a way where it's actually effective and not just pretty weak. So that's all I want to say about Yaten, and that's pretty much all I want to say about this month in Dragalia Lost. There's a lot of things I'm excited about. Obviously this video went way longer than I thought it would, uh, just going over a small amount of updates, but I did want to share with y'all some of my predictions, hopes and dreams for the Mana Spiral, for the banners, share my first Omega Clear, my experience with the event so far, and talk about the last few other details in this What's Ahead or This Month in Dragalia Lost like the Monster Hunter collab like some of the changes that should be coming in 2020. So I hope that you enjoyed watching. If you've stuck around this long, thank you so much. Thank you as always for watching and supporting the channel. I really appreciate it and hope that you're having a great new year so far. But as I said, that is going to do it for this video, everyone. So take care and I'll see you next time.